have done it enough times to say to say I, I ski, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I've skied. Yeah, that implies something much different than I ski. I've skied. I've, I've played tennis. Yeah, not very <laughs> well, but I've done it. <laughs> I fell down a mountain in a slightly, you know, in a way that didn't kill me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like a controlled fall. Controlled fall. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody to today's Solid Ground live stream. We are delighted to be here with Neil joining us to have a discussion today. And um, uh, David, you want to start us off with an intro to Solid Ground? Yeah. Thanks, Leslie. So Solid Ground is a peer support community for anyone concerned about the imposition of critical social justice, CSJ, aka WOKE and or COVID mandates in their workplace, university, children's school or community. We offer weekly online peer support groups in which members share ideas, thoughts and support for how to navigate the impacts of these ideologies and answer the question, where do we go from here? You can join one of our groups for only $5 per month. To find out how to join our community, please visit solidgroundsupport.com. And please note, Solid Ground does not provide psychotherapy or legal advice, and nothing we do should be construed as such. Excellent. Well, it's so nice to see all of you today. And it's Likewise. So nice to see Neil. Yeah. And so Neil mentioned to me some study that he's been doing in marketing recently, and some ideas that really were applicable to the situation that we've been discussing and the topics that we've been discussing. And so we thought it would be great to have him join us and to broaden this discussion. And so Neil, would you wanna kind of give an intro to what these ideas were, an overview of what we were talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. So um, I've been studying marketing for um, a consultancy that I'm building and I need to know a little bit more. And what I was surprised to discover was how much behavioral psychology is central to good marketing. And in particular, the concept of um, trying to change people's behavior. You might think of that in like terms of um, wanting to get somebody to buy something. But also politics is essentially marketed. You want people to change the way they vote or act in certain situation. And so the basic things that came out that really sort of come to the surface and I thought, oh my goodness, this is very applicable to this type of discussion, were world narrative or worldview. Um, what's your worldview? What's your internal narrative, which can best be understood as people like us do things like this? Hmm. And then status. How do you see yourself in the world in terms of status and particularly relative to others? Um, so as, as I started to look at these three areas, I realized that what you've just spoke of as, as woke or, or critical social justice is extremely well marketed. Um, and it had never occurred to me that that was the case. I was always confused personally about why people took on ideas which I could, I look at and, and rationally challenge. I was like, why, why do people take on these ideas? Um, and then as I've started to study marketing, I've realized that our, a lot of our decision making isn't rational decision making, it's quite emotive and it's quite quite a lot to do with how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive the world around us and how we want to align those two perceptions. And from there, um, I feel like I understand this entire movement like so much more. And I've studied this stuff theoretically for a couple of years, mm. but three months of marketing and it was like something like a penny dropped and I'm I'm seeing things very differently now um but rather than me just speak about it for like a half an hour or 40 minutes if there's anything like that even from what I've said already that you want to know a little bit more about we could start to explore it as a conversation um when, when you said it was looking at one yeah I was going to say when you said it, and when you said it, it's extremely well marketed. And what did you mean by that? What did you come across? What? Yeah. What okay. Was that? So, um, a couple of years back, one of my friends who works in animal welfare, um, 
it's such kind of like peak BLM period. He contacted me and he said, oh, you know, we really want to learn about the BLM method of um, like marketing because we want to apply it to um, animal welfare because they've managed to onboard so many people into their, their idea so quickly. And my response to that was critical race theory, blah, 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 postmodernism, blah, 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 blah. And I focused on theory and just ignored everything he'd said. And until now, and now I realize, um, okay, so for example, the world narrative, that's uh, uh, the world view that all of this supports all of these ideas is that um, justice, injustice is widespread and it's systemic. It's very simple. Um, and I guess most of us will probably think injustice is widespread, but it's not systemic. So that's a different worldview. It's a very simple difference. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, the its systemic worldview is much easier to align to in terms of, well, you don't need to think through the complexities of the reality. Uh, and you can also remove any personal individual responsibility, even to the extent of saying, oh, um, you know, let's say, for example, white privilege or, or um, that the racism is, is some systemic white um, inherited system. Well, if you did feel in any way that you might be a, a racist white person, it's so much easier to say, well, that's because of the system. It's, it's not me, the individual. So you know, it's quite easy to align to when you're not certain about things. And it's a very simplistic worldview. So you've got these two, two different competing worldviews. I think most people acknowledge that injustice exists and it, and it is quite widespread or there's differences. And, but one is a very complex view that there's many, many things at play, including the individual collection system, history, culture. The other view is very simple. The simple view is much more easy to market, by the way. It's the system. Break the system. Oh, OK. So that's that's one example. Um, if we look at the internal narrative that we all hold in some way, people like us do things like this. Um, so let's say people like us who want to make the world a better place, that want to solve injustice in the world, do things like anti-racism, pro-trans rights, um, anti-fascism, maybe even anti-capitalism. Um, so it's quite easy to pitch towards the people like us, people with good intention, to then give them a toolbox in which they can act upon that good intention, which fits nicely into their worldview that they're not the problem, the system is the problem, they're not personally responsible, it's an external responsibility, but because they're the good hearted people that want to see the change in the world, here's the toolbox that allows you to deliver on that. None of which requires a great deal of self-education don't really need to have to study postmodern philosophy or socioeconomics over intergenerational trauma or any of these more deeper topics which are probably more informative um and then the last part of it is just about status is how we perceive our own status in the world and in relation to others and i think this one's very interesting there's basically most people's status in the world goes down two opposing channels. It's either domination, so people that want to win, and their status gets elevated through winning, and affiliation, which is people that wish to belong to the right group. So some people just want to be on the winning team, and other people just want to be with the right people. And that's a very simplistic view, but you can, and you can get into it into more detail, but status tends to go down one of these two channels. So if we look at people that um, want to affiliate, they want to be part of the right thing. They want to be on the right side of history, for example. And they may want to do that by raising their own status, looking good in front of others, by joining the right group and raising the status of other people. So a very simple way of looking at it would be like the heroic type of character. Superman is the perfect example. He could have dominated the world, but he chose to help the world. So... He was raising his own status by raising the status of others. That's what philanthropists do, largely. Those that declare their philanthropy anyway, that don't keep it hidden. 
but it's also what social justice warriors do, so to speak. They make themselves look good in the world by erasing the status of others. Along the lines of people like us do things like this within a narrative of or a worldview of the problem is systemic, we just need to change the system. So you can start to play this out in a little bit more detail. You can go, but as I started to see things like that, I saw how easy it was to pitch to people. Get on board with this idea. You can associate with the right side of history. You can act out your you know, good intention of changing the world to make it a better place by getting rid of an inequality. Um, and it's embedded in this quite easy narrative that the world is historically or systemically problematic and therefore all that we need to do is get together collectively and change the system and then the world can be a better place and you're yeah. basically tapping into an underlying value system that is shared so a shared sense of cultural or social values and then you're mm -hmm. offering a set of of simplistic like heuristics and rituals that can be performed that will simultaneously satisfy this, this value system in this simplistic way, while also conferring status gains on the on the person who accepts this. So it's that's really interesting. Am I am I summing that up? Very well, much better than I could. So yeah, absolutely. No, that's really interesting. I think that's a great observation. So, Neil, do you think that, I mean, when your friend approached you and said, yeah, we want to know more about how BLM does their marketing, like, can, can we, are we accurate to imagine that somebody somewhere actually sat down and thought, okay, how can we, let's strategize. And they, they were actively knew that they were using common mark behavior analysis, like, to, to try to like actively market this. I mean, I mean, I just think about BLM and it's like Black Lives Matter, even just that statement, that slogan, like that, that was obviously brilliant, right? To that cap, that captures a lot right there, that statement, who's going to argue against that, but and who's not going to get on board with that. Right. But I mean, the larger part of it, like the, the creation of this whole thing, do you think there was somebody in a room somewhere with three other people brainstorming? Okay. Mm -hmm. Or, or did it just like kind of evolve? Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm wondering. Like I'm thinking about the evil, you know, evil people in a room somewhere. But, uh, like in my mind, it's like how can we make a shit ton of money? You know, like how can we make money? Like not so much like how can we dominate the world, but how can we make money off of this like white liberal, you know, yeah. the group that they're marketing mm -hmm. to, right? White liberal, guilty middle class, mm -hmm. you know, those people. How can we? sell this so there's a couple of ways to look at that i mean one is that all of the theory behind the black lives matter movement if, to talk of that specifically so critical race theory intersectionality and postmodernism that's got an enormous long history yeah that has a strategy which is um get inside academia first inside academia you can then create people that become advisors or operatives in a broader sense, whether that's marketing, politics, business, HR, education. So that's a strategic pathway. Um, and a strategic pathway has a long-term vision of change. And that's basically what strategy is, is a long-term vision of how a change can be implemented. And marketing is, is extremely strategic in that sense. So I would say that it would be inherently there would be a marketing mindset inherent in any long-term strategy of change that you're trying to deliver. Um, to the point where I think, to try to get closer to, was there ever a point where a cabal of people sat down and decided, right, this is how we'll deliver it and this is how we'll you know, um, make green off the back of it, so to speak. But I think about some of the iconography used in BLM and how, how very quickly the thing to do was to change your Facebook profile picture mm -hmm. or Twitter avatar to I think was it was it a black flag I can't remember oh, or the, the fist or the fist yeah maybe like yeah. banner thing 
Yeah, and now it's either a Ukraine flag or it's a pride flag or but that <laughs> that marketing tool, find yeah. a logo that clearly represents a movement and you know affiliate by showing it and then and denigrate anyone that doesn't. And that's that's a marketing tool right there. That's a, a tactic actually, but it's a very, very effective tactic. And the fact that something like that even appeared. I don't know whether that would be organic or whether that was considered, but the overall effectiveness of picking a title for a movement, which just as, like you say, Black Lives Matter, who couldn't get on board with that? Okay. So as a sentence, you could to refute that would be, you know, socially suicidal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you dig into it as a movement, it, there's something else there that's that's not just about Black Lives um, being important and mattering right? the fact that any attempt to make all lives matter uh, a valuable statement got crushed very very quickly mm. and and that to me also feels very strategic um, mm. if I was trying to sell my story I don't want a competing story that looks really similar so mm. as a, in a marketing perspective I would go out and sabotage it too um, <laughs> That's really interesting. Right. So I'll play that devil's advocate. I'll play that. I'll be the cabal of one in the in the room here and say, yeah, I would I would imagine that it was sat down and very carefully considered about how to really propagate a message very quickly um, to consider what reasons people might reject it from the base of basis of worldview. People like us do things like this, and and the conference of status. And I think from those perspectives, you could you'd easily come up with what we saw happen in that one particular area of social justice. But you so can look like, very into trans rights as well, and it's quite similar. Right. So it's very opportunistic in a way. It was like an opportunity on the back of of the thing that had already been happening. I, mm. Interesting to me is when you said this is what people like us do, mm. and then with the Facebook stuff, like, and then. You know, this is, and we're going to show who we are. We're going to have these banners, or we're going to put the pride flag, or whatever, and then denigrate. the The flip side is that that is then, and you guys out there, the us them stuff, are the people who don't. You're not on board, and the denigration. So that it's almost like it's not just like human behavior. It's like, well, I guess this counts as human behavior. This like something very primal. This in group out group stuff like this is our tribe this is our herd and that's the herd over there and not just like live and let live but we're going to try to destroy you unless you try to be in our herd almost as if like it's like try in order to validate our own being in this herd or i don't know there's something very very destructive at the heart of it and in group out group stuff that, that it capitalizes on our natural or think and like almost animal instinct mm -hmm. to like this is our species here and we're staying in this mm -hmm. and we're going to denigrate and try to destroy anyone who's not in our group what that's you're saying there jody that's what that strikes me as like that's the it's such a cheap like social gain that is made by adhering to these philosophies or to these marketing strategies or whatever you want to call it because that's the social gain. You'd get it by putting other people down. You don't have to really do any other thing except demonstrate allegiance and then denigrate the opposition or anybody who even just wants to come in with a clarifying um, broadening of perspective. It's not even about, it's just, if you're not gonna adhere rigidly, we're gonna, we're gonna cancel you or, sh or shout you down. And so that's the social gain. It's that process of let's, Let's circle the wagons and point the finger. And so it's a really cheap game. You know, and, and it has to be public, right? You have to like, it has to be very, very public because you have to show everybody I'm, I'm destroying this other person's life. <laughs> Therefore, look at how good I am. Yeah. Right. It gets. Right. And look at, and look at what will happen to you if you yes. contradict or criticize our messaging in any ways. I tend to think it was quite a coordinated strategic effort because one of the um, founders, Patrice, I don't know how to say her last name, Colors, I think, had said in an interview, we are literally trained Marxists. Mm -hmm. So I think there was quite a bit of thought to how they marketed 
themselves and they capitalized so quickly upon the death of George Floyd. It, I mean, for, for that to have been so successful and for the troops to have been rallied so quickly, they really have to have been lying in wait um, just waiting for the next event to happen that they could use, they could co-opt into sort of proving their point and furthering um, what they want to do. Is it, is it also though that like it was it was not just their ideas it was the fact that corporate you know corporate america corporate west corporations in the western world took this up as a kind of an easy an easy kind of route to kind of show themselves since the crash in whenever it was 2008 to be good corporations who are doing right by the world and i mean e even even a Marxist I'd have a little bit more sympathy for because at least they're looking at economic inequality, whereas this push to make it about race or gender or something, I felt like something that they, they could solve a bit easier by just maybe bringing on a few more black people into a board or something like that. It was almost like, I wonder if there's, it's like a corporate engine going, actually, we don't have to think about economic inequality because that's a real tough problem. We've got a simple solution here and we can just, you know, put maybe not even putting people on your board, you just need to put it on your Twitter page, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why wouldn't they jump in on it, right? Hmm. Well, it's a good marketing campaign. Yeah. It's your point, isn't it? Good marketing yeah. campaign sell things. Okay, we can sell products to this entire group of people. Once that group of people got large enough to be an economic body worth engaging with, then all you have to do is say um, your worldview is our worldview. People like you buy things from people like us. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good point. I'm just, I'm, I'm Neil, I'm also fresh from a day spent talking about power, privilege, and diversity. So it, you can't, you can't, like you can't, um, I can't tell you how much it's, it's, it's music to my ears. It's like, it's literally like a feeling, a wash of a feeling of, okay this is calming me down a little bit just to hear you talking because uh, there's been such a muddle this this during this day and people have been stuck and things were said and and, and nobody knows why they, nobody knows why we're stuck nobody wants to say anything people are fearful the people who are facilitating the day those that wanted to put it in put it in place have kind of they abdicated responsibility and they said we don't really know what we, we should do what should we do better and it's just there's all this mess and I like the fact that you're cutting through the noise a bit here and and talking a bit about how why these ideas spread in the first place. What was it about the, the stickiness of them? They're almost like a like a Richard Dawkins would talk about it as a meme, wouldn't he? But you're talking about it even even in terms we understand even more because it's about it's literally about marketing. <laughs> um, so one thing that sort of stood out for me as you guys were talking was. Um, that as Jody you were saying about us if there's an us there's a them and yeah. I've noticed something over the past few years which probably already existed but I hadn't paid attention to is how if uh if you were to say um you know I've got some reservations around critical social justice then you'd probably be labeled a Trump supporter if you was an American or a conservative if you were British a Tory um probably an anti-vaxxer probably this probably that and very quickly, it's like you. There's only one worldview that exists, or there's two: our one and your one. And any other um, more nuanced perspective is treated with, with really high levels of suspicion. Not amongst everybody, but I'd say the large majority of people just fall into these two categories of of us and them. Um, and so. And then there's a very small number of people that are actually can detach themselves far enough and step back far enough to question the validity and ideas across the spectrum. You know, the, the radical sense, Leslie, you've placed yourself um, away from both groups and with an openness to value and lack of value in, in both directions. Um, but what I think is target audience for this marketing campaign were people that saw themselves as being um, on, on the left of politics, generally speaking. And that's a very big, broad category of people. 
And within that category, there, there are people that respond to status quite differently. And I thought this was very interesting. Um, the idea in, in within marketing is that um, people tend to maintain their status. Um, very few people want to shift it too far. Some people might want to maintain a high status or try to shift it up a bit. Um, and that would be kind of like your social justice warrior um, or the type of person who just wants to win everything um, by crushing the opposition. So that's a, the dominant type versus the affiliative. The affiliative type is the is the superhero type. And then but there's also people that want to lower their status. And, and I couldn't understand this at first, but it's about being safe. People with a low status are far less of a target in the world um, because they see, they seem or appear less effective. Um, so they tend to be more ignored. And a very gentle example of someone that maintains their low status by helping others is the type of person that opens the door for people, the type of person that lets someone go in front of them in a queue. And I was thinking, how does this apply? Uh, how does this play out within critical social justice? And I started to think about people that... Um, unpack their privilege or literally lower their status as a human being in favor of other human beings mm. so if you're that type of person if you feel that the way that you survive in the world is by going up below the radar and not being a target and not being too much of a, a a trouble for anybody else or a changer of anything there's a marketing campaign for you too. declare your privilege unpack it silence yourself so that others can speak and then but if you're the dominant type that wants to crush and win everything then you can just go out there and tell everybody how terrible they are and how great you are and how you're the ones to change it all and then there's a final category of people those that lower their own status through denigration of others which is to me is a very bizarre group of people but it does exist and people that are very angry very narcissistic very toxic in how they express themselves and I was thinking, does this group of people have a place within this this whole um, within sort of like the woke arena? And then I started to think of libs of TikTok and how many people go on there and just say the most horrid stuff about others and present themselves in the most terrible way. But there does seem to be it does seem to be that every aspect of status and how that might play out within this worldview. Uh, and with this in, this internal narrative of people like us do things like this has been accommodated in some way. And then when I look about when I try to look at it from a different perspective, which is um, what's being done in response to this whole movement. And it's not so cohesive. There's not such a coherent sort of message that stands. There's an anti woke thing and it tends to be reaction to. But I don't see a structured people like us, different us, because we have a different worldview, do things like this that you can become part of, um, which would incorporate such as things such as, you know, um, let's say we recognize injustice in the world, but see it as more complex. So people like us think more carefully about how we resolve issues, seek to include everybody's opinion, but try to test that against the truth or test that against reality. And that, um, so that, that's just a slight shift, but I don't I don't see it in a very sort of concrete manner. It certainly doesn't have logos or movements with names or and it's just generally seen as anti something that already exists. And being anti is quite is a negative framing. So I, well, that's that's the problem. Right. I, I was just as you were talking about the us them stuff, I was thinking the us, the the strong and loud existence of the us 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 blm blm probably also solidifies a them right mm -hmm. because if you're kind of like ah, i see like problems with that and with that then you're kind of like you have the the politically homeless trope right mm -hmm. like and it's hard and it's hard to when things feel so like it's such an existential threat maybe it's a status thing but you feel like god i have to like pick a side here because I have to go into the them, which is all is made more strident in opposition to the us. Mm. Um, and and that's also an easy. It, it captures all it seems like to hit all the same check boxes, but just in the opposite direction in some ways. Right. That's, that's the thing, Jody. So, I was 
discuss like forced teaming. Yes. So, because otherwise there is no team because there, it isn't easily done by a logo or a, like, it's not, it's not quick. Like, and it is nuanced and complex and you are going to have disagreements and it's like, you can't just get on board with this simple formula, which is either for or against. That, yeah. That's what I think of the anti, like anti-woke, right? Anti, what is it? It's not a thing. It's not some coherent thing. It's not a movement. It's, it's rational people from all different walks of life using their critical thinking skills to say, I don't think this makes that much sense. And so it's not a, it's not a group. It's not a people like us because it's a, it's just, it's people. <laughs> I, I, that's, I guess that's a first thought. So I would love to hear something that contradicts that if you have thoughts, but I also wanted to ask you, Neil, when you're talking about two different categories, I wanted to see if you could expound on the, the, the contrast there between the type that are, are gaining status through denigration of others or through putting other people in their place versus the toxic um, narcissistic class that you mentioned at the end that are just kind of lowering their own status by, um, by putting other people down. What's, would you mind talking a little more about that? Okay, so the, the idea is that, um, so we have people that associate their status for affiliation and they're, they're the, tend to, we would see them probably more positively, generally speaking. So um, I'm gonna make the, myself look better by raising you, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna fly below the radar and keep myself out of it by raising you. So they're, they feel you, they're more easy to understand, I think, generally speaking. Um, so the other side is is maybe a smaller group, but people that understand their own status through domination. So you've got the very competitive, maybe people that go into like athletics or into politics that seek to win at all cost um, and are quite happy to make you look bad to make them look good. I think those we can understand quite well as well. Um, quite. Sometimes that's a very positive attribute if you need to desperately need to win something, um, but it can also, um, you know, it tends to be quite an aggressive position. The group that is unusual is those that want to stay below the radar. They don't want to be um, put into the into the limelight. Um, so they don't want to necessarily win, but what they do want to do is. Uh, They don't want to affiliate with anybody either. What they it's hard for me to describe, but essentially they maintain their low status by causing pain to others. And in so like they, they, they create in a space where they will be rejected. And they feel safer in that rejected space because there's nothing expected from them. Um, so, in, and, and it feels like a tragedy just to describe any human being that feels the need to position their life in that way. And I, it sounds like people that have trauma, um, mm -hmm. but there are, are, there are many people that will continually maintain their low status and they might even leverage that as victimhood, for example. Um, so they actually victimhood is probably quite a good descriptor because it requires an oppressor. So I don't want to be. Um, responsible for leading a group of people I don't want a high status I don't want people leaning on me and expecting me to achieve great things I feel much safer where nobody really wants to look at me and no one wants anything to do with me where I'm invisible and out the way um, at the same time I don't really want to affiliate with a group to achieve that I don't even know how to go about doing that maybe I have to be nice to everyone and put myself down and I don't have the energy for that either mm -hmm. so possibly the easiest escape route in that situation um is to be the angry victim and say everybody else's fault you're all terrible people look what you've done to me that's why none of you want to come near me don't come near me um it's very it's kind of a toxic internal place for a human being to be in but that victim narrative is actually sold in critical social justice as being a very valid position and we probably see that more in, in the realm of therapy than in other areas where um, people desperately hang on to their victim status as an identity. Mm -hmm. And it alleviates you the responsibility of doing anything about it because you say it's somebody else's fault. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So it plays into that troubled side of many people. Um, and I think that might actually now I'm thinking about this for the first time. I wonder if that's where, particularly within social media, that development of the victim narrative and victim status as being something that people want to own has come from. And that probably feeds into the sort of social contagion of trans movement to some degree as well. Because um, if you declare yourself trans as a child, as a younger person, let's say, that puts you into a very small category of people that are automatically victimized and, and therefore need to seek lots of attention, but don't have to do anything in return. You don't have to give well, anything. It's also, up. somebody mentioned this to me a little off, but it's also a way if you're white and you're being taught you're an oppressor, mm -hmm. if you're if you become trans, now you're yeah, now you're being oppressed. Like it's it's a way to get out of that stat yeah. if you don't want to do the if you don't want to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm yeah you, if you stack your intersectional score well enough yeah. then you actually gain power from that mm -hmm. uh, and that's often just a matter of declaring appropriate identities which score better on the oppressed side than the oppressor side you can offset your whiteness by becoming trans <laughs> yeah yeah if it were a game yeah and there were a scoreboard that's how you'd play to win this us them th sorry you guys just tell me if I'm I'm dominating the conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> us them thing has been plaguing me for quite a while because, I mean, there are people have tried to organize a movement around being reasonable and nuanced, and it just doesn't seem to take. Mm. It's not. I think that it's i don't know it is dangerous to not at least name the problem like critical social justice is a big problem and i think well i guess now we're getting into the nuance like some people i guess some people would pick critical social justice apart and say well this part's not a problem but this part's a problem whereas like some people are like no the whole thing is a problem and some people are like it should never even be taught and other people are like oh but it's just a theory well, you can teach it along with other theories it's it's a theory isn't the problem the problem is when it's implemented you know there's all these different arguments about how to argue against csj so i guess as i'm speaking i'm, I'm naming the problem of why it's so hard to have a more nuanced because because everybody's kind of all over the place well it's because you, know, you almost have to become a reactionary cult like a counter cult if you're going to yeah. really organize and i think that effective yeah 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 i mean if you're going to use the same strategy i think that's why this sort of pushback defies um the formula a little bit like there's a lot of talk about what are we for let's stop talking about what we're against but what are what is we what is we and how do we make a we out of this because then you fall into narrative counter narrative and that is just that same process of polarization. And I think that staying sort of sort of grounded and open is in itself a value. I, here I'm I'm gonna start rambling. So somebody else. <laughs> I was just thinking like I was just thinking we got you can't just put things on placards to sort of say, you know, we, we don't have a defined enemy in a weird way because we want to speak to people about the fact that. Their, their ideas about injustice are, you know, we we, we we commend them on their <laughs> their zeal to want to go after this stuff, but we just think that there are other things to talk about. But to sort of say on a placard, you know, what do we want? Change. When do we want it? Iteratively and after a thorough discussion. <laughs> Doesn't quite work, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Very hard to market, David. <laughs> Maybe you can help with that, Neil. Yeah. <laughs> David, I'll buy that shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, that and then we have with the marketing. Now we have like with this with social media and viral stuff and the George Floyd viral the vir virality. Isn't mm. that also a sexual term? Virility, virality. <laughs> 
the virality <laughs> STDs. Anyone? The BLM STD three letter acronyms. Um, <laughs> isn't there? I mean, I was just going to say, like, combining this brilliant marketing with social media. I mean, that it's just like it's like a like a lit match in a yeah. pond of gasoline, just push, mm. instant. Well, yeah, for a lot of reasons, right? Because social media already is training people to have short attention spans and and use a lot of shortcuts to coming to decisions and making assumptions. So there's that. Plus, and like same group out group stuff. Yeah, yeah, and the glossy, slick, you know, repetitive programming. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, kind of goes hand in hand with all this stuff. I think it's like perfect storm. Neil, you've got to help us out of this. We've got to, we've got to mark it out, you know, our ideas better somehow. We've got to somehow, I mean, I know Jordan Pearson talks about, like, he, he thinks the things that get to, to really capture people's attention is to talk about res responsibility over rights. He talks about that's maybe where we mm -hmm. can capture people's imagination. Um, I don't know where to go with that, but um, I think he's got a point. Um, yeah, well, what about there's I think there's something we're not thinking. Of. Oh, sorry. I, I have to say this though. So I'm dominating again. I'm so dominant. Um <laughs> <laughs> and there's something about um maybe we're thinking about this the wrong way. Cause think about the power, because I was just thinking about individualism, right? That's that's incredibly important. And if if our if we're like, no, individualism, and we're like no collectivism, individualism, it's like, well, then that all falls apart because as a collective, you have all this power, but as individuals, we have the same problem. But think about what individualism spawns, which is art, music. Mm -hmm. Think about the power of what's his name? The the guy that, that makes the, the rap videos, um, anti woke, those rap videos. He's huge, the white guy. Yeah. Um, McDonald. Is it McDonald? Yeah. Something McDonald. Like Tom McDonald, I think oh, is yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the yeah. most unwrapped name you could think of, like super white name, like, <laughs> and he makes a video. It's like got 4 million hits on YouTube. I mean, that yeah. the power. So we, you have all these different kinds of people from all walks of life. I mean, I was listening to a middle-aged white lady, right? Like all like can gravitate towards something. It's, it's, it's a really catchy, it's got good lyrics. Like it makes you feel, if you can evoke the emotive stuff, Neil, you're talking yeah. about like making decisions based on emotions, like then and you can do that with a song it doesn't have to be like a logo or a movement it could literally be a work a piece of art so that's one way you can get movement going I think. yeah Hope. i think that's really i think that's really great and i also think that that taps into another thing that that is maybe a shared i and i've talked about this before but i think it's a shared value um culturally across cultures is courage and one thing that we lack when we're falling into groupthink is courage we're we're sliding into the easy go along to get along kind of mindset and you've got a lot of people who you know fit into the categories that you described neil who are buying the marketing and who are going to to put that that outfit on and wear it but then there's a lot of people also who are hovering around the edges who are allowing it to 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 go allowing this to propagate and kind of saying the phrases but aren't really feeling it and what they need to tap into is a sense of of courage and if we can i think that that is one thing that i don't know how to market that really but if we can talk about that and the, that people are so afraid to look stupid <laughs> people are so afraid to be the fool and if you're in a group of people and they're all saying, well, the sky is green and you're going, it's blue. You know, like if you're in the ash conformity experiment, you're yeah. you're afraid to be the guy who calls the line the length that you really think it is because you're gonna look stupid and everybody's gonna look at you and go, what's wrong with you? And you're doubting yourself. And yeah. I think that tapping back into that self-assurance and that courage to, and and maybe, I don't know, how do you, how do you talk about that in a slick marketing kind of way? Be <laughs> the guy who beats the ash test i don't know don't don't be the guy who zaps everybody in milgram's test i, I don't know you know <laughs> but there's something interesting there because when it, any successful marketing campaign initially is isn't 
aimed at everybody. Okay, let's just say, for example, you have a, a target group of people who you want to change their behavior in some way. So you define who they are. Let's just say we, we want to influence uh, the people that want to make the world a better place um, by doing positive things for others. Mm -hmm. okay, we will aim for that group of people. Um, what change do we want to see in that group of people? Um, we want to see them uh, maybe use more courage or to be more courageous. Let's just say that for, for, for what you just said. Okay, so you don't then try to change 20 million people to become more courageous. So that's really, really difficult. What you aim to do is okay, within, within any group of people, there are a very small number that are kind of technically referred to as neophiliacs, people that love the new. Mm. Um, you could also call them early adopters. Mm. Um, or you know, they're the, 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 the person that bought Bitcoin before everybody else, or uh, you know, the, the person that tried paragliding when no one else was prepared to do it. Um, you, there's always someone out there that wants to take the risk of doing something new so they can tell other people that they took the risk of doing something new. And then they propagate the idea on your behalf. So what you would do is you'd look towards a group of people and say, like, here's a group of people that are actually really close to us, but there's some differences. And we can kind of want to edge them over here a little bit more. Um, so maybe back towards more traditional forms of liberalism, as an example. So already liberal, already left minded. But I've got a little bit caught up in this narrative that it's systemic. And we want to shift it back towards this other narrative of individual courageousness. So within that group, you're just looking for a small number who are going to be the first ones to champion this idea. Mm. Now you're actually aiming to influence a small number of people in a very specific way. If you can formulate that clearly enough to yourself, then you can act upon it in a way that you can sh strategize and reach out. And honestly, academic theory and that sort of direction, I don't think is easy to, to sell. It's taken, like Marxism, the best part of 100 years to get gain any traction, and that's too long. But music, like Jody's pointed to, mm -hmm. cultural artifacts. Mm -hmm. So music, art, sport, um, I don't know, something that people can um, quickly grasp emotionally. Memes. You don't have to grasp too much. Con yeah, like mm -hmm. it could be pet ownership. Like it could be almost comedy. anything. Yeah, comedy. Humor. Comedy's brilliant. Comedy's yeah, big. yeah, yeah. Because it's courageous in itself already, mm -hmm. uh, and it dares to. So you, that's the way I would approach it. I'd be looking to. I wouldn't want to change everybody. I'd look at one specific group. Then I'm trying to narrow that down with to a specific change, and then look for. The types of people that would respond to that first, and how do you get a message to them? And then, you know, once you've got one group to start to shift, you can then start to work on another group with a different marketing campaign. You know, council culture versus uh, um, uh, unpacking privilege versus pulling down the man. You know, these are all very different ways of reaching different groups of people to try to affect the same type of change. So rather than the them and us, which in, so from the perspective of not woke, it is uh, a very, very diverse group of people that don't form an us, not a clear. There's no clear us. Uh, there's people there who are there because they're actually hardcore conservative. Um, there are people there because they're very liberal. Uh, there's people there because they really challenge these ideas. Um, and there's people there who are, who are actually just out and out racist homophobic people that just like no like we stand against this <laughs> inherently they don't even form a group right you can't even get those people together but you don't need to actually all you really need to do is formulate a very clear strategy for changing one group of people to shift their behavior in a very slight way and because that's all that's really happened if you i mean i think that's all that's really happened with this movement in the first place is yeah. most of the people that seem to have got on board with critical social justice before they heard critical social justice would have been on board with civil rights. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. not that far away. It's just a slightly different worldview and then a really clear set of tools that you can affiliate and pick up and join um, 
where you can feel like a champion. Where you can feel like you're making a change because classical liberalism is a bit of a slow cooker and it takes time. You know, it's very effective, but it takes time. It's took a long time since the Enlightenment to now for things to change. Whereas this new movement offers what feels like revolutionary speed of change. We can change it right now because the target is really clear. It's the system. We can change the system. Get on board now. Don't miss out. You know, <laughs> you, you want to buy into this now because you don't want to be late on this one. You know, like, <laughs> it just feels now. The more I think about it, it just feels like a really good sales campaign. <laughs> that whole, that whole thing. It's just like shit. Have you just been pulled into? Now. Yeah, into a, into a really clever marketing campaign. All we need is another clever marketing campaign to shift them to that next stage. So the next stage in this revolution is um, including everybody again. Mm -hmm. Is to stop stop the counselling and bring everybody on board. That's the next stage. And you know, expand it further by including all the white people again and all the straight people again and, and everybody else again. And you back to where you were, but with a lot more energy. So maybe just need to hire some good marketing people. Looks like we got one <laughs> for a job, Neil. <laughs> we don't I'm, pay much. I'm three me. months into learning about marketing. Like three months ago, I didn't know anything about marketing. I decided I would teach myself. My goal was by the end of this year that I'd be really good at strategic marketing. So every book I've bought since November has been about marketing. But like, so this is just kind of random. You're like. Oh, I want to learn more about marketing, or I think you said at the beginning you wanted you it's for a purpose, right? Yeah. So as you as you know, I was training to be a psychotherapist. Yeah. And I stepped out of that training because of this particular woke movement. Um, and I've got a friend who's a a, a psychotherapist too. He's been for about 25 years that I also met through CTA. Um and he, he kind of wants to get out of psychotherapy too. But we both really still want to use what we know about people and personal development and growth and relational growth to help people um, fulfill their life. But we're gonna do that in a very specific way. We wanna look at people that build um, tech and business to business services that are looking to make change in the world and help them overcome anxiety and deal with challenge and deal with chaos and crisis because we're entering a decade of poor economy massive social change and massive technological change and it's going to be really scary i believe for the next decade that is the world's going to be uh, a quite a volatile place and to be successful in that space is hard but there are ways that you can do that and, and a, lot, a large part of that is being able to see um opportunity in chaos um and and learn to to develop a mindset that responds to change by going ground towards ground and you know, finding center um, rather than being shaken by by the difficulties of the world. So we are setting up. Uh, we were going to call it consultancy, but we're going to set it up slightly differently. It's more like um, collaboration as a service. Uh, we're going to set up this different format of working with people where we can bring young entrepreneurs business founders people from different ages different backgrounds together to help each other to find stability to lose anxiety to get connection to find a sense of belonging and to, and to build the businesses that they want to to put into the world and we think that would be really really good thing to do and my business partner in this he's like the most introverted person i know and he says well one of us has to do marketing and it's not going to be Neil, me, Neil. It's just, it's, you're going to have to do it. He says, otherwise, this isn't getting off the ground. End of story. And I said, OK, like, I'll do it. Um, he said, great. What do you know about marketing? I said, nothing. I'll go learn. So that's where it started. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. I think it's such a fascinating topic. And uh, I plan to be good at it by the end of next year or the end of this year. That's my goal. Great for you. Very applicable. I, see, I mean, it's I can see the the crossover like in the, the your interest in the field of like psychology, how it's I mean, particularly this topic, it's but it all marketing is human behavior. I mean, you have to know human behavior if you want to be effective, right? 
Yeah. You want to know how to trick people. (laughs) (laughs) I interested in it. Yeah. (laughs) I I took a a consumer psychology. I need to win their money. (laughs) It was great. Um, before we wrap up, I want to read a couple of chats and then we have to we have to go so Jennifer can get to her group. Um, so let's Thanks, Neil. Uh, PNY photo video says hello. Flash White says hello. Patty P says getting crazy out here. Love you all. Mark Cavendish wishes us all a Valentine's Day. To this entire panel, be my Valentine. Thank you, Mark. Oh. <laughs> uh, Dave Boy- <laughs> This. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the number one rule to not allow objectivity discourse was genius. It's referring back to the the woke marketing. I think that's really uh-huh. true. Mike Wilson art. They were allowed to capitalize by middle upper middle management of some of these large corporations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just reading. I'm just going to scan through. I'm not reading all of them. CNY photo video says, in order to be a good person, you must pay your medieval penance. That relates to the the one group you were talking about there, Neil. One one of the groups. Um, yeah, the like unpacking privilege. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chris R. Never ever will the same put up with censorship or marginal marginalization of speech. I think that just refers to the diversity of people who are objecting to woke. It's just it's putting them into the category of the same. Same. <laughs> Uh, at its core, Jay Bourne says, is individualism versus collectivism. And uh, yeah, so here, I'm just going to scan down. Oceana 23, 95% of the public doesn't know that critical theory and critical thinking are two different things. We're screwed. Yeah. I hope we're not screwed, <laughs> but I kind of agree with the first part. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some some folks offered up Tom McDonald when we were tr- trying to catch yeah. his, remember his name. So yeah, that's it. Yep. Oceana 23 says, Peter Bogosian calls it uh, parhesia, the Greek parhesia. phrase for courage. Have you heard that? Yeah, parhesia. 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 Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. And um, yeah, so I will, oh, how do we find Jennifer's group? Hugh Slalom says, how do we find Jennifer's group? So Jennifer, you want to? Or Jody? Yeah, you go to locals, right? And there's a link on our Well, local. yeah, so yeah, so there's an explanation on solidgroundsupport.com of how to do it. Um, basically, our platform is on locals and you need to become a subscriber to our locals community. It's $5 a month. And then you have access to any slash all of the meetings, including gens. So the only only people who pay get behind the get access to the links. Uh, so, and we think five dollars a month is very reasonable, and it helps keep the groups a little bit safer from outside influences. And I will say, we have not, at least in my group, and I think all of your groups, like we have not had any infiltrators to speak of that we know of. So that's good. Yeah, um, if you want the locals, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, no trolls yet. Yeah, no trolls yet. Um, so the solid ground locals is it's Jody Shaw. I couldn't change the URL. So it's jodyshaw.locals.com. Um, but again, you can go through solidgroundsupport.com and just click on, I think it says get support, and it'll walk you through what to do. It's five dollars. So if you go there right now and join locals for five dollars, then you will have access to the locked posts. And you will be able to come to the mm-hmm. Jen's group today. And we have four groups a week. So you can join just one if it suits you. You can join as many as you want. If you're part of the group, if you're part of the team, you can come, come to, to all of them. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys for a great conversation today. And Neil, I'm so glad you could join us. I hope we can do this again. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, these ideas, I'm just kind of spout in us that come up with them so it's really nice to have dialogue with people to make more sense out of it um but yeah i'd love to come along and talk about anything that's useful to chat about thank you awesome thanks for joining us neil lovely to see you jen thank yep. you thanks neil it's been awesome cheers All right. nice to meet you Dave. yeah okay